what does Christ promise you uh, when you bow before him as Savior and Lord? Uh, what does he promise? I, I did this back in 1967 as, an, as a nine-year-old. Uh, I knew full well what I was doing. Uh, and uh, when I was saved, uh, they, they assigned me to a class uh, with the pastor who taught all new converts uh, for several weeks. He gave me a little packet that I still have, mimeographed, remember mimeographed machines? Now, those those amazing. Uh, I still have that mimeographed set of notes of Bible verses he wanted me to memorize. So one of them was John 10.10. 10. Uh, and in that particular passage, you can understand why God uh, uh, wants us to understand this text, why this church had us memorize this. It says in verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door, and if anyone enters through me, he shall be saved. I notice the cause-effect relationship there. We'll come back to that. And he shall go in and out and find pasture. Uh, the thief only comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus says, I came that they, his sheep, might have life and have it abundantly. Um, so uh, you are either in Christ's sheepfold or you're not. So you're, you're either uh, in sin and out of the sheepfold of God or you're, you come through Christ the door into Christ's sheepfold. So I would put to you uh, one of the greatest decisions you can ever make in your life uh, is to move from the sheepfold of sin into the sheepfold of the Savior by coming through Christ who is the door. He's the door. There's only one door into his sheepfold. We'll come back to that in a minute. But Jesus says, if you come to me as the door to the sheepfold, uh, I will do two things for you. Number one, he says, I will uh, save you. I will save you from your sin. And then I will bless you and I will do it abundantly. He says both of those things. I'll save you and then I'll bless you. Uh, so if you're a Christian and you're a sheep of God and you're part of his, his sheepfold, uh, you are saved by the Savior, who's not only the door to the sheepfold, he's also the good shepherd of the sheepfold, and he's also the, the lamb who gave his life for your sin. So he's all of those things. But he says, I'm going to bless you. So he says, I came that they, my sheep, might have it kind of ho-hum life. It's not what he said. He said, I came that you might have life in what fashion? Abundantly, abundant life. So he came to shower blessing down upon you is what he wants to do with your life. So like, like what? Like what kind of blessing? Um, and well, as I pondered my life and walking with him, and basically a sermon is uh, I study during the week, God speaks to me about me, and then I come and talk about what I learned so you can, what he wants you to know. So what, what was God telling me? Well, he says, look at your life and look at the blessing that I've given to you. So uh, I'll just click down through some of the blessing that I've seen God bestow upon me, which I'm sure you can identify with. Uh, when you become a Christian, when you become a, a lamb of God, uh, he gives you a cleansed conscience and a cleansed soul. And it's hard to explain to somebody that doesn't know Christ, but I remember the day in 1967 uh, when I did that on September 5th, the Sunday before school started the next day, I went from uh, you know, not knowing God to, to knowing God, and I knew I was, I was clean before him because his blood had washed me clean. There's nothing better. Uh, he says, I, I come to give you that blessing. Uh, you also have a divine uh, resource for wisdom and guidance, that the Spirit comes and dwells with you, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and he then gives you the wisdom that you need for the decisions that you make. Like if you're a young person dating, what's your big question? You're not dating? Okay, Pretend. So if you're dating and you're dating somebody, you're thinking to yourself, is she the one? Like my daughter used to ask me, Dad, how did you know Mom was the one? Well, you just know. Well, how do you know? Well, I don't know. You just, you just kind of know. Um, God gives you wisdom, and you can ask God, this one, that one, uh, this job, that job. Uh, should I leave this job, leave that job? I mean, God gives you wisdom. That's a blessing. Uh, you have the ability to understand the deep things of God as you go along. So as a Christian, as a new Christian, uh, he gives you the elementary things of the faith, the rudimentary things, and then as you obedient to him he gives you the deeper things to understand in the faith uh and there's nothing better than having wisdom that comes from god that's a blessing gives you hope for the future as you watch uh the world uh, embrace evil and call it good uh and go off the proverbial cliff morally and spiritually and logically speaking uh how do you have hope and joy for the day how do i well i know who has his hand on the wheel and that's the lord so it gives me hope because i know the king is coming so i don't lose hope uh, that's a great blessing. He gives you great relationships with other believers. Uh, my wife and I have many relationships uh, here in the church with great saints. Uh, that's a blessing. Um, he gives you the spirit of discernment to know that's evil, that's not evil, pursue this, not that. He gives you the understanding of things that are evil uh, and gives you wisdom for how to have a, have a great marriage if you are married. Uh, I've been married 41 years. Uh, I had a young person down in Orlando. Uh, we were I forget even how the subject came up, but... Um, I was a young person behind the counter, so how, what are they, 20? 
you know, and, you know, wanting to know, you know, like, uh, where are you from, and blah, blah, blah. It, it, somehow it came out, we've been married 41 years. Next question is, how'd you do that? Not why, but how'd you, how'd you do that? You know, so just looking at the young person and telling him, well, uh, Jesus Christ is at the center of our relationship. That's how you do that. And you can just see, it's like deer in headlights. What are you talking about? Uh, so it's just wisdom for how to have a great marriage, uh, how to raise great godly children. How do you do that? It's so easy to raise children, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, right. I always find it amazing those couples who have told me over the years uh, who are having marriage troubles who tell me something like this. Pastor, we're just going to have children so that they can help us get our marriage together. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to need God to help you with those children to get your marriage together. So uh, God gives you wisdom how to raise children. And, and God gives you uh, great blessings through your prayer life. Many times I've prayed things that God has answered them in ways that were just jaw-dropping. Is like unbelievable. And those are all blessings from God that he bestows on you. So let's go back to the, the basics of the verse. Jesus is the door of his sheepfold. Leads to a couple of questions. Number one, are you in that sheepfold? Before we, I'm, and don't worry, I'm getting to Psalm 128. And you're wondering, where's this guy going? I'm going there. Just give me some time. Um, are you part of, a, of Christ's sheepfold? Because that's what matters most. How do you get into his sheepfold? It's your decision to come to Christ as the, as the door, to say, Lord, forgive me a sinner. You, you are the lamb who laid his life down for my sin. Forgive me for my sin and accept me into your family. And he's going to look at you and say, hey, come on in, never to leave again. So I would submit to you, today is the day to do it. And whatever arguments that you use to pose against that decision and whatever person is keeping you from making that decision, uh, that ideological system, that level of argumentation against God or that person who makes you fearful for making a decision for God, in eternity, they will not be worth it, nor will that position you hold that's tenuous be worth it. The only thing that's worth it in eternity is a relationship with Christ. Now, I want to talk to the Christians, because that's what Psalm 128 is about. Uh, Psalm 28 is, uh, is about, if you're a Christian, uh, you want to leave, leave that blessed life that Jesus talked about. This is Old Testament version of John 10.10. How do you have a blessed, abundant life that Jesus is going to talk about in the New Testament? Well, he's going to give you the, the, how you go about doing that. So we're going to look at a, a question, like a hermeneutical question that derives from the text, which is a very simple one, and it's this. How do you attain a blessed life? Who would not want that? I mean, how do you live like an abundant life, no matter what's going on? Well, first of all, he's going to tell you, well, the road to blessing is pretty simple. It's in verse 1. Now, this could be the shortest sermon I ever preached. Because you already know that's not going to happen, but <laughs> such a loving, caring church. Yeah, yeah. Um, is your smart church after 13 years, correct? So what's the road to blessing? Well, verse one is the key to the entire passage. In fact, you could kind of skip the other verses, uh, which talk about the blessings he'll pour out on you. But really the key to the whole verse, uh, the whole passage is verse one, where he tells you the road to a blessed life. Um, we could move through this quickly. We're not because we're just, we're not. <laughs> There's just a lot to talk about in verse one. So we realize from verse one that it is a song of ascents. Uh, uh, so if you were here two weeks ago when we introduced the, the Song of Ascents, they start in chapter 120, and they end in chapter 134. So as Jews went to the temple to worship God, they had to literally go up the hill, up the mountains, to the temple. So it was a physical ascent up to the temple. And when they did that, they sang songs. Uh, so Psalms 120 through 134 are the songs they sang. Psalm 120 and 121 were ones they, they sang as they walked. Then once they arrived at the temple, they had other songs that they would sing. 128 is one of those songs. When they're on the temple mount, looking at the temple, this is the one that they sang. We don't have the, somebody wrote me the other day and said, have they ever, have they found the music to these songs? <laughs> How many years ago was this? Like 4,000 years ago? I went and saw Amy Grantis this week. Have you? Yeah, speaking of 4,000 years ago. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, I went with Kevin and his wife, and we had a great time, set up right in the front, got there early, it was awesome, uh, great food. I've never been to the, was it the Birchmere? Yeah, it was, it was awesome, I had a great time. Uh, I've never seen her in concert, uh, heard her music over the years, it's great to see her in concert, she's doing well uh, after her heart surgery, um, and um, we were there for a couple hours, uh, but what was funny is I went home, and I had uh, music from like 1980, 81, Amy Grant music, you know, for the piano, and I'm looking at the picture, and her, and I'm like, whoa, I mean, these are two different people here, you know. Uh, it just happens. But I still got that old music. But can you imagine 4,000 years? No, they don't have that music anymore. And so uh, we want to look at what this old music tells us about how to have a blessed life. So it's a song of ascent. 
They're on the Temple Mount, and he's going to tell you how to have it. So how do you have an abundant life? How blessed is who? Everyone. Speaking of Christians, who does two things. Number one, you fear God, and number two, you obey God. That's what it says. Walking is obeying God. That's why this could be a really short sermon, right? Because I just told you. You want to have an abundant life, what do you got to do? Two things. Obey God, but you got to first fear God. So let's, let's analyze that. Now, realize that's the New American Standard Translation. So uh, that's what I typically use. Uh, the word how is not in the Hebrew text uh, of Psalm, of this particular Psalm. So the very first word in the Hebrew text is the word blessed. It's the word asher. Uh, so one of my Israeli guides in Israel, when I take people over there, uh, Army Paratrooper, uh, Master Sergeant, his name is Asher. So every, imagine the mother picked that name, wonder why. Well, every time she said it, she's saying, ah, oh, he's a blessed son. So that, that word means to be blessed. And so he, he places that word first in the sentence. Uh, it's not a verb, so it makes it emphatic because it's not a verb. And he says, you want to lead a really blessed life? Well, let me tell you how to do it. Now, I was in, as I told you, I think I told you, uh, the church I was in last week, the church plant was kind of a semi-Pentecostal kind of church. A little livelier than we are. So um, when they're talking about the blessing of God, it has a little more oomph to it. Thank you. We have one here. Thank you. Uh, yeah. You, you know what I'm talking about? They're just a little bit more. Whoa. So it's not like, you want to be blessed of God? You know, it's, that's more our version of it, isn't it? Theirs was more like, blessing, hallelujah. It was kind of like that. So he says, you want to be blessed of God? You got to do two things. You got to fear God and you've got to obey God. So let's go through and analyze all that uh, as, as God teaches us. So uh, think about fearing God. God wants me to fear him? I thought, I thought I could go before his throne according to Romans 8 and call him Abba Father. He's like my intimate father. C can you? Yeah, yeah. But you should still fear him because he's, because he's God. Uh, Hebrews 10.31 says this about God. It says, quote, and he's speaking to Christians in the context. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, Christians are great. I've heard them use this against non-Christians all the time. Boy, they're going to get theirs one day living God. He will consume them with his glory. I mean, huh? Um, no, read the context. He's speaking about Christians. This is a motivation to obedience that he will first judge his people. Read, read, the, read the warning passage. There's, I think, five of them in the book of Hebrews written to Christians. So uh, this is our, our word from God. Uh, he's holy, uh, and, uh, and he's, he's high and lifted up. So yes, he's our father, but we should maintain an avid attitude of reverential fear. Um, why? Well, let me click down through some of the things that I, I've learned in my Christian walk about an attitude of reverential fear for God. Uh, number one, according to uh, Psalm 69, verse 5, uh, when we sin and we feel the guilt of sin, uh, he not only sees the sin, he sees the guilt. So there's no way to reason your way out of that one because God knows all those things. Number two, it says in Proverbs 15, verse 9, you should fear God because he detests the way of the wicked. And as a Christian, you have the option to be obedient to God or not be obedient to God. And when you choose not to be obedient to God, don't kid yourself thinking that he winks at your sin. He does not. I, he says, I detest wicked ways, uh, which is why you should fear him. Uh, Proverbs 1, 28 and 29 says he doesn't listen to, to sinful people. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Ephesians 5, 5 says that God who is holy will not allow that the wicked people into his heaven. Not one. Remember, who's the gate? The door of the gate. Jesus. You either come through Jesus or you don't come through Jesus. So is Christianity narrow? Yes? Yes? Who made it narrow? God did. So if you have an issue with it, don't email me. Email God. Tell him, hey, what's up with that? Thought it was multiple ways. He's going to tell you, no, it's my son's the only way. He's the only way. So God should be feared because he's the only way. Um, God promises uh, to test and reward the lives of every believer in 1 Corinthians 3. It's a very sobering passage. It's the bama seat of Christ. When you comes before his judgment bar and he looks at your life as a Christian, it's not judging you for heaven or hell. You're going to heaven. He just wants to know how well did you run the spiritual race? And he tests your life by throwing your life into the, into the fire to test you. Uh, that'll motivate you. Uh, it says in Hebrews 12 that God promises to discipline saints because he loves us. Like a parent. Why do you discipline your children? Because you love them. You don't want them to continue that behavior, so you discipline them. God does the same thing. Has, God dis has he not disciplined you? Uh, sure, he has. Uh, before I came here and I was planting a church in California, which was not a simple thing to do, uh, God was refining you know, something out of my character that wasn't pleasant, and you know, he was disciplining me. I, I knew he was. And it just went on for weeks, months, years. You ever have this happen? It's called ingrained sin. 
And I was out on a walk one day, and I know Hebrews chapter 12, whom the Lord loves, he chastens every child, blah, blah, blah. I, I know it. So I finally just, as on my walk, just had a, had a talk with God to tell him, I, I've got the picture. I think I've got it. Can we move on? I wouldn't suggest telling God to move on from divine discipline because he just continued it for a couple more years until he really refined me in that one area. So God, that, that's a reason to fear God. Uh, God warns us that he shows no partiality to anyone in the texts that are listed there. He doesn't care who you are. Could you imagine on Judgment Day as a Christian, you come before him, they throw all your works into his fire to test your works, and you say something like this, hey, I just wanted to let you know, uh, <clears throat> I manage a very large company with 1,000 employees. What is it, what is it? If you're an angel standing there, what are you going to tell this guy? Mm, probably shouldn't have said that. I mean, suppose you're standing there and you're like, you just don't realize, just, man, hey, I'm super brilliant. I have a PhD, a couple master's degrees. I, I, Lord, you know, it's so awesome I'm here. <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't care. He doesn't show partiality to anyone. So we're all equal in his presence when we stand before him. Uh, and that, you know, it, as he tests us, that, that causes you to fear him. Uh, Psalm 33 verses 13 to 15 tells us that God sees and knows all. He's omniscient. Uh, so it says in Hebrews 4.13, there is no creature hidden in his sight or from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare before the eyes of him who, with whom we have to do. Boy, if that is not motivational, nothing is. I mean, God who sees all and knows all, who is everywhere because he's omnipresent, he's omniscient, I should fear him because of those things about his character because I have to give account to him one day. Uh, and then we also read that God should uh, be feared because he's absolutely holy. Like Leviticus 19 says, God says, you shall be holy. Why? For I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Because I'm holy, you should be holy. So when you come to Christ as the door to the sheepfold, uh, he, he covers you with his blood and cleanses you. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, Paul calls this positional holiness. He gives you his holiness because you didn't have any. He gives you his holiness. That's called positional holiness in theological terms. Then comes all the mandates in scripture, the commands to live a holy life. That's practical holiness. That's totally different. God will judge the practical holiness to see, well, how well did you follow hard after me? If you want to look at a summary uh, of uh, reverential fear for God and what life is all about, all you have to do is read Solomon's closing words in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. So the conclusion of the entire pursuit of Solomon to find meaning and purpose in life is when it has all been heard, when all arguments, ideologies, theories, etc., about what's life about is summed up, he says, what is it about? Two things. Fear God and keep his commandments. Why? Because this applies to every person. For God will bring, this is the motivation, for God will bring every act of judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it's good or evil. Now you can stand before God in two ways. You can stand be God, before God as his sheep, covered by the blood of Christ, and he judges you and rewards you accordingly. Or you stand before Christ with no coverage of the blood of the lamb, and you're on your own. And your works will be found wanting. He says, uh, chief end of man is to fear God. Uh, because he, you will give account to him one day. Aren't you glad that when you stand before him, if you know Christ, you can say, but I'm, but I'm covered by the blood of Christ. Uh, our life will have to give account one day. There's a man, uh, his name is D. Wilbur Pinfield. He used to be the director of uh, Montreal's Neurological Institute. And he gives us an idea of how Judgment Day could happen as a, as a brain scholar. Here's what he says. He says, your brain contains a permanent record of your past that is like a single continuous strip of moving film complete with a soundtrack. He says, the film library records your whole waking life from childhood on. He says, you can live again those scenes from your past one at a time when a surgeon places a gentle electrical current and applies it at a certain point of your temporal cortex of your brain. As you relieve, uh, relive the scenes from your past, you feel exactly the same emotions you did during the original experience. Could you imagine this, Judgment Day? <laughs> You're standing there. It's your turn. They call your name. It's alphabetical, I'm sure, because God is organized. You come forward. I'm at the front of the line, I guess, Baker. Eh, wow. Uh, if, you, if your name is Zylon or something, you'll be later. But you get up there, and, and, and God says in, to the angel, okay, it's time to test them. He comes over with some kind of probe. Well, what are you doing? Sticking this on your temporal cortex. Well, not today you're not. Uh, well, right now we are. And they just stick that on there, and do, boom, out comes your entire life. I mean, not that God has to do that, but it's stored in there. It's stored in there with the sound. I mean, imagine. God's going to say, oh, let's, let's, let's evaluate your life. Uh, and, be, and he will evaluate you to see, well, what kind of life did you live? According to 1 Corinthians 3, he judges not the, for the Christian, not the 
quantity of what you did, but the quality of what you did, uh, the motivation behind what you did. Because you can deceive people with the quantity, but God knows the heart of why you did what you did, and he rewards accordingly. That's why you should fear him. Uh, number two, why is a life of reverential fear of God that kind of life which leads to happiness? I mean, why is that the life? Uh, I'll give you some ideas. Number one, divine fear keeps you from getting enslaved to sin. Why? Because I know God has given me the power to walk away from sin, but if, when I fear him, I stay away from sin. So it's not my, it doesn't master me. A divine fear keeps you humble as opposed to haughty. Boy, does it. A divine care, fear keeps your conscience uh, clear from getting stained by sin. Divine fear keeps you leaning and learning from God, not leaning on your own intellect. Uh, yesterday, my, my daughter's been gone with uh, Pastor Greg for the last couple of days. Um, it's, her, it's her birthday weekend, and so she's, they've been out of town. So we're, we've been watching the three grand, grandchildren. I'm 63. <laughs> They're busy, aren't they? You kind of forget how busy they are. Well, yesterday was soccer day. And uh, so since my wife was doing a bridal shower yesterday, uh, and I was the soccer guy, you know, I, I don't do this. And so I, I went with my little folding chair and sunscreen, whole shebang. And <laughs> as I'm sitting there, I don't know any of the parents. They're all half my age or younger. I'm sitting there, man, I totally don't fit into this crowd. And uh, some lady walks by me with a shirt on that says, believe in yourself. Could, could we talk? Uh, yeah, could we talk? Uh, you know, because uh, if you fear God, uh, you look at yourself and what do you see? I see, well, some good things, but I see lots of sinful things. And I need to lean on God because I fear him. And he teaches me uh, about myself and my limitations. Uh, divine fear keeps you from fearing an evil, wicked person. Why? Because you trust in a God who's absolutely holy and you don't have to fear a man. Uh, so, uh, Isaiah was a, a person brought into God's presence, and in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and he immediately surmises, not, this is an awesome place to stand, but he says this, woe is me, for I am ruined. He says, because I am a man of unclean lips. He's a prophet of God, but he goes and stands before God's holy throne, and he says, what do I see? I see his holiness, and I see my wickedness. Uh, why should you fear God? Because he's holy. Now, this particular passage tells you that's one thing to say I should fear God it's another thing to do it so how do I know if I'm fearing God he tells you that in the last part of the verse so how blessed is everyone who fears the Lord how do I know if I'm doing that well he tells you how do you evaluate your level of reverence for God you walk in his ways walk in his ways how do you feel about participles <laughs> do, you, do you like participles they're, they're most thrilling okay so this particular word walk halak in Hebrew uh, is, a, is a participle. So how, how blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and who walks in his way. So it's present tense, right? So this participle has two classifications. Uh, it could be a durative use of the participle or it could be the iterative use of the participle. Well, how do I know which one it is? Well, just think about life. If it's a durative use of the participle and walking means I'm obedient to the word of God, then that means if it's durative, I constantly do this and there's never any deviation. Is that you? Anybody? If it is, we'll talk about pride next week. That's... <laughs> Yeah, if you think you had a perfect week this week before God, we need to talk. Um, doesn't mean you couldn't have made improvements, but durative, participle, impossible. I'm going for the iterative use of the participle. What does that mean? Your obedience comes and goes. Is that not your life? Are you with me? Yeah. And, and, and so you're saying, Lord, you know, I, I want to fear you, but how do I know if I fear you? Well, my life goes in and out of being obedient to you. Hopefully it's more obedient one day than the next day. Uh, but, but that is how I know if I fear God, by the level of my obedience. Uh, so you have to ask yourself, am I obedient to the word of God? You come to church, you hear the word of God, uh, and you leave church, you should be thinking to yourself, man, I know what I've got to do today. I absolutely. Uh, I have to do X. And, 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 and you go out and you do it. That's an obedient Christian. See, a person who's obedient because they fear God uh, uh, doesn't fear the things that happen in life because they have wisdom. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 2, talks about, uh, the, from James, who experienced uh, much opposition in his life by, when he came to know uh, Christ as the Messiah in Jerusalem itself. Uh, notice what he says in verse 2, as a wise man who fears God. This is most amazing. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. <laughs> Let's just stop right there. Are you kidding me? Consider it all what? Joy? See, we usually look at trials and say, Lord, deliver me from that, or Lord, keep me from that. What does he say? Uh, well, no, no, I consider it joy when I face trials. Why? Well, he says, when I face those, I am knowing 
that the testing of your faith, my faith, produces what? Endurance. This is why playing sports is so awesome. When you play sports, it teaches you pain is great because through pain you learn to endure, correct? I mean, I remember wrestling in high school thinking, I hate these drills. But when you face your opponent at a game, you're glad you did those drills because the pain you feel and the endurance you learn, it helps you when you're up against the opponents. It's true. And he says, let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect, mature is what he's talking about, and complete, lacking in nothing. So James says, when I look at my life as a God-fearing man, I obey the Lord. And one of the ways I obey the Lord is I look at my trials that I face and I realize they're not pointless. No, they're purposeful. Uh, and I will trust him even in this. That's a person walking with God. You got trials, you got afflictions, uh, embrace them. Uh, Fanny Crosby said years ago, she wrote many hymns, uh, all the trials that she went through. Uh, she, she wrote this little thing once in a little book that she wrote, and it's this statement. In acceptance lies peace. In acceptance lies peace. My mom's uh, sister, my Aunt Roberta, that died of cancer, uh, 52 years old after battling it for about 13 years, and she was an assistant Bible study fellowship leader, impacted hundreds and hundreds of women. Um, I asked her, Aunt Roberta, how, did you, how do you maintain a positive, powerful impact for Christ battling cancer that eventually went to her brain? She said, it's that phrase, in acceptance lies peace. I accept every diagnosis, every surgery. I embrace it, and God uses it great, greatly in my life. That's a wise woman. That's a godly person applying the word of God to their life. Is that you? How do you go about taking the fear of God and obedience to God and actually do it? Paul talks about it in Romans 6. Notice what he says. He says, therefore, if you're a Christian, do not let sin, sin reign where? In your body, your mortal body, that you should obey its lust. Uh, and do not go on presenting your members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So how do you go from reverencing God to obeying God? Paul says you have the choice as a Christian with the spirit who resides within you to ask for his power to resist sin, to put away sin, and live in a godly way. So if you're, if you're an addict struggling with whatever your addiction is, how do you get victory? Well, you appeal to the Spirit's power, the power of the Spirit in, in, in comes to you, and you do not submit to whatever the temptation is, and he gives you the power to overcome that. He gives you the power to be victorious, to walk away from sin, to not be mastered by sin. This is called yielding your life to the Holy Spirit of God. I would say that is a daily thing. Why? Because you have mortal desires that go against the desires God would have. And as you fear God and seek to be obedient, the, your, your yielding to the Spirit for power gives you strength for the day. This is probably why you should start your day off with prayer and why you should start your day off with Bible study. To get that firmly in your mind so you're ready for whatever gets hurled at you that day. So if you want to lead a blessed life, you've got to do two things. I told you it could be a short sermon. It's not. What do you got to do? Two things. Fear God and Obey God. Walk with God. Walk with God. What are the results if I do that? He's going to give you some results in the closing verses. Uh, he says here in this passage, um, results are, well, when you eat of the fruit of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. When you eat of the fruit of your hands. Where did that come from? My job. He says, oh, you're going to be excited about your job. And he said, you're going to be happy because it's well with you that you have this job. You have to stop and ask yourself, Okay, I, I fear God, I obey his commandments, and one of the results is, I love my job. Do, do, do you love your job? That's why you're so quiet now. Yeah, all right. Uh, he says, well, if you're walking closely with God, uh, you're going to love your job. Why? Because you're going to realize it's from his good hand, that he gave you that job. I would not say that every job I've ever had was the easiest job, uh, was the most cruised job. I purposely in my life took all kinds of jobs that were with really rough people, tough environments, people that did drugs, people that drank on breaks. I mean, I've, those are the jobs that I took. Uh, so over the last 13 years that I've been here, I've told you I, uh, different jobs in sermon illustrations. So I've had people tell me, what have you not done? Well, it's called survival, true, right? Okay, so I'm going to give you every single job I ever did. Are you ready? Got notes? Ready? Because for me personally, I look at all these jobs that I have done, and each one of them was from God's good hand that I enjoyed them as he blessed me. Uh, I cut lawns in junior high and high school in the desert heat of Imperial Valley, 120. I cut a lawn one day, it was 132. That was a day I didn't mow. But I, that job was, those jobs that people gave me were from God. Uh, I worked as a, a busboy at Denny's during high school as well. Uh, I worked at Baskin Robbins also in high school. 
awesome job, by the way. <laughs> because the owner told me on my first day there, at, when you close the building down at night, you can have whatever you want, as big as you want. We put that poor guy out of business. Anyway, moving on. Uh, I was a janitor at Azusa Pacific University, uh, and I was a janitor for Western Christian High School while in college. Every night, I cleaned the university, Hillside Campus in LA, and I also cleaned the high school every single night. Um, I sold boats in Los Angeles during college because my roommate's dad owned the largest boat dealership in LA. So I sold deep sea boats, lake boats, river boats. I sold them all. Um, I worked as a gardener for Azusa Pacific University during the day and worked as a janitor at night and took 18 units. Follow? Uh, I worked uh, as on a longshoreman dock uh, during the summers uh, in, in Hopeville, California, uh, icing railroad cars. Uh, it was a very dangerous job with longshoremen. Um, I worked as a gardener for Ireland Landscape when I got married in 1980. Uh, I remember the first day that they dropped me off with my crew. <laughs> it was, they were working on the, the landscaping, uh, the side of a hill in I, on I-5, and they dropped me off. The entire crew were Hispanic. Most of them were illegal aliens. I, who grew up on the border, most of my friends were Hispanic. I think this is cool. They don't speak English. They're looking at me like, what's up with the gringo? <laughs> I'm like, Hoodley, here I am, man. Yeah, I remember day one working there. It was pretty interesting. But then they understood that I grew up on the border with, with, with them, and I understood them. They understood me, built great relationships with them, and I understood lots about myself and lots, lots about them and their culture. Because for one thing I learned is, boy, you want to see people who work? They worked. I learned a lot as a young married man. I was a lone gardener at the same time when I got off work at night uh, for a condo complex with about 40 to, 40 to 50 yards I took care of at night after I got off work. Um, I was a gardener for Dallas Theological Seminary. I was a tree trimmer for Dallas Theological Seminary. And that's before they had climbing gear. So we free <laughs> all through those trees with no gear. It was scary. I didn't think I could die at that point. Um, I worked uh, for the commercial division of Allied Van Lines while I was in Dallas Seminary. That's another thing I did. Uh, I've been in, I think, every skyscraper in, in Dallas and Fort Worth. Uh, I washed windows also during Dallas Seminary. Me and a couple other guys had 500 window accounts. And I carried 18 units. And I was working on entering the PhD program in Hebrew at the same time. Uh, I worked as a forklift driver after I left the PhD program, uh, uh, loading trucks uh, uh, in Lodi, California. Uh, I was a youth pastor in a retirement community. <laughs> really? You're, anyway, yeah. What was I thinking? Uh, in Arizona, I was also uh, a Christian education pastor at that same church. I planted a church in California for 20 years. Uh, I had side, side land, landscape jobs while I planted that church for 16 years. Uh, I had a traveling notary business uh, that I used to close loans for a title company. Beef also, um, so I pastored a church, did those jobs, and I was a chaplain for 1,300 sheriff officers. And then I moved here, and I've been here 13 years. And no, I don't do side jobs anymore. But, but I look at all those things. Why am I telling you all those? Uh, to tell you, I, God has blessed me with all those things. He blessed my life. He always provided for me. I had to work for it, and I worked with some scary individuals at times. Uh, guys dropping acid, smoking pot, drinking. I mean, I worked with all those kind of guys, guys who threatened me at work, etc. cetera. Uh, but I looked at it as a great opportunity to share Christ and to be Christ's hands and feet to those about me. And God blesses you. If, uh, if, you, are, if you are a person who fears God, he will bless your job. Enjoy it. He'll also bless your wife. Verse 3, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. He'll bless your wife like a fruitful vine. So translate, you want to have a great marriage? He's talking to men here. He says, you want to have a great marriage? I've been married 41 years. How do you have a great marriage? Christ at the center, fear God, and then obey God. So what is your wife waiting for if you're the man of the house? For you to be a spiritual leader of the home. And when you're the spiritual leader of the home, it says here, she will be fruitful. I mean, her life will just be amazing, and so will your marriage. So what kind of man do you need to be? A man who fears God and obeys God. And I'm not talking about the guy who drops his kids off and, and lets them off at church and then drives away. I'm not talking about the guy that comes into church more often than not with his family. A, a guy that his kids see him reading the Word of God, see him praying at home. Then father stops and prays for his children. I mean, a spiritual man. If you're that spiritual man, your wife is going to love you, and she's going to respect and honor you. And her life will be fruitful. Why? Because she will see you following hard after Christ. She'll feel safe. And she'll honor and respect you. And, and she'll act in a wise way toward you. 
And your children, they're going to get blessed too. He says, your children are going to be like olive plants around your table. Tell them that today after lunch. You remind me of an olive tree. <laughs> really? You know, uh, this is a major blessing in the Hebrew text because uh, uh, olive trees it grew really old and produ produced medicinal oil for uh, wounds. They also produced the oil for cooking. I don't know if they used them in salads at the time. Probably not. Um, but your point is your children will be a blessing to other people. What parent would not want to raise children that bless the lives of other people? I mean, isn't that what you want? I mean, don't you want a child when they go to the university, they won't walk away from their faith? Don't you want a child that when their peer pressure is all against them, they'll stand strong and true for their faith? I mean, who wouldn't want that kind of child? He says, well, how do you get that child? What well, starts with the father. The father fears God, obeys God. The mother then fears God, obeys God. And then the children are like, wow, we need to fear and obey God. See, I thank God that I had a mom and a dad where my dad feared God and obeyed God and my mom followed suit. And the blessing was for me and my two sisters. He says in verse 4, let me uh, remind you again what this is all about. Verse 4, behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. What should you be doing as a man, leader of your house? Fearing God and then obeying God. Is that you? Then he says in verse 5, let me pray for you. Here's his prayer. The Lord bless you, Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Indeed, may your children, may you see your children's children, your grandchildren, Peace, shalom, be upon Israel. Israel. Let's make it a modern day prayer. This is my prayer for you. May the Lord bless you from heaven. May the Lord, uh, may you live to see the city in which you live in. It's not Jerusalem, but your city. Be spiritually given over to God. Uh, may you live to see your grandchildren, not just to see them, but to see them in love with Jesus Christ. There's no greater thing. And I'm a grandparent. I get it. Uh, may you live to see peace in your country. Because that's what he just prayed. So how does all that happen? When I, when I determine to be a godly man, I then in turn obey God's word. It blesses my family, blesses my wife, my kids. And then it, then, then it blesses not just my family, but my city. It, then it in turn blesses my state, which blesses the states, which blesses the country. What's the key to America's return back to greater things? The family that fears God and obeys God. And it all starts with us. May we be those kind of people. And may God bless you abundantly. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to open a, an ascent psalm. Uh, it's easy to talk about these things and to tear them apart and look at what they mean. It's a whole other thing to apply it to life in a consistent way. Give us the ability to do that. And uh, bless us. May we live to see your blessing shower down upon us uh, and to praise you for how abundant it is. Thank you for our jobs, how you've worked in our lives in tremendous ways. Uh, and we pray for those who don't know you, that today would become the day that they walk into the fold of the sheepfold of Christ. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, God bless you. Uh, have a wonderful day.